Good evening. Uh, I'm your Lynn, uh, sister Lynn Evans. I did my procedure in 2002 here in Northern California. My decoria is Our Lady of Fatima. Anyway, Father Joseph Hamid was the superior of the Holy Transfiguration known as Mount Tabor. In a, it's a monastery, a Byzantine church, right, right Ukrainian Catholic monastic community in Redwood Valley, California. He entered the monastery in 1982, was ordained a priest in 1991, and elected abbot in 1999. A few years ago, he joined the Contemplatives of St. Joseph with the founder of Father Vito Peron, based in South San Francisco. Father Joseph is a gifted speaker who is often invited to give talks and retreats because he had spent three decades as a monk, monk in the blessed prayer and study. He has a very solid and orthodox grasp of Catholic teaching. Father Joseph is a prolific writer and an author of three books, which you guys saw there. Joy Comes with Dawn, a reflection on the scripture and life, a place prepared by God, a personal in-depth reflection on the mystery of the mother of God, brought about by his profound and intimate experience of a real living mother with whom we can personally relate. In his third book, How Lovely is Your Dwelling Place, Father Joseph helps the reader lift the veils that tend to conceal the mysteries of God so that it is easier to recognize and enjoy his presence. He has also written numerous articles in various religious magazines on a wide range of topics. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome. Let's welcome Father Joseph. But 
that's all very good in itself, but I think we have to ask two questions about this. The first one is, what happens when Lent is over? And then the second one is, what has changed within us uh, as a result of these efforts? If our giving up stuff for Lent is just a formal and, and somewhat uh, distasteful practice that you perform just because the church recommends or requires it, and if you immediately abandon it with good riddance come Easter morn, and with great enthusiasm you throw yourself into doing quite the opposite, then it will have done your soul little or no good. Sometimes people ask me uh, what, what to give up for Lent. And so what I, what I usually advise them is to give up something that they won't take back on Easter. If you, if you give up some favorite food during Lent and then gorge on it come Easter, <laughs> you haven't really gained much. You're still the same person with the same passions that you fully intend to indulge. But if you give up something like a grudge you're holding against someone, and then remain grudge-free after Easter, you have gained a lot. Don't give up a grudge during Lent and then take it back on Easter. That's a lot. <laughs> so but this way, you, you uh, advance uh, spiritually. And so whatever we do for Lent should be something that, that effects a change within us. So that when, when we strive for, for virtue during Lent, and not just giving up a thing that you take back, then, then you, you keep going. Say you, you uh, acquire a certain virtue this year, and then you hold on to it come Easter and through the next year, and then next year during Lent, you can try for another virtue, and you hold on to that, and you keep growing. So by the end of your life, you're, you're, you're full of virtues, and you, you've gotten rid of your, your vices. And that's the whole idea about Lenten sacrifice, not just a temporary halt in your, in your pleasure seeking, but uh, something that's really going to change your, your heart and soul. And so also doing things like practicing charity or your patience around those who irritate you or, or going out of your way to help someone in need is very beneficial. So the objective is always a genuine and lasting conversion, a real interior change that takes root in your soul and makes you more like Christ. So then we, we find that there's a spiritual principle underlying this new interior state and per perspective. It's something that um, helps transform all of our Lenten efforts. And we discover this principle in a, this, a following story. Uh, a woman who was a, a recent convert to Catholicism uh, wanted to do all the Catholic stuff right. And so when Lent rolled around, she decided to give up something like everybody else did. So she prayed about it and asked the Lord what she should give up for Lent. Interiorly, she felt him say, just give up. Initially, she wasn't sure what that meant, though she knew it didn't mean to abandon the struggle or to cease fighting the good fight. Then it came to her, the Lord doesn't merely want our offerings piece by piece, though he'll always accept whatever we offer sincerely. He simply wants us, whole and entire, right now, give up, surrender, offer your whole self not merely a token that doesn't really come from your heart. So this way, um, it, this helps with our, with our inner transformation. We, when, we, when we just give up, just hand ourselves over completely to God, uh, we start uh, seeing the big picture, uh, accepting what God has already done in us. And then we give uh, this wholehearted uh, self-offering as a, as a grateful uh, response. And only when we've given our whole self to God, then we can start giving up the individual things. Because then it all comes from a, from a, a soul that is, that is handed over to God. Because the, the individual actions then, even the most exterior ones, are now flowing from the heart. A heart that is given to God without reservation. 
So this oblation of just giving up, just handing over ourselves to God, sanctifies everything else that we do to please Him, and it makes everything else fruitful. So, so we, you don't look at things from just the individual perspective. Well, I'm going to do one little thing, and then I hope that I'm going to gain some grace by doing this one little act uh, during Lent. And, but that, that doesn't reach you very far. It doesn't, it doesn't bear much fruit either. Oh, my, it might help a little bit. But if you just say, I'm giving my whole self to God, and then now that my whole self is given to God, I can also do this, and I can do this, and I can do this. Because it's coming from one person who has <coughs> handed himself over to God. So um, let us just take a take a, a look here and see um, what see Lent's already halfway through, so we gotta we gotta get busy here. We haven't done much yet. So are we just going to give up stuff, or are we going to give ourselves as like a precondition for all other sacrifices? Do we understand our Lenten efforts as a matter of the heart and not just a formal requirement? Are we willing to say that complete yes, which gives value to all of our actions? Or do we try to just get by with the, the minimum and the merely external and, and, and just get it over with as soon as quickly. So if you want to uh, experience that peace which passes all understanding, and to be able to radiate the face of Christ to others, then don't give up something for Lent. Just give up. <laughs> something else that we have to give up are, the, are our inner defenses against God that we may have unconsciously built up over the years, by which, uh, we, which we might not even be fully aware of. Some years ago, I read the book Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Now, and maybe some of you know that, but it's worth reading. It's kind of a glimpse in, into the heart of the father and the tragedy and salva salvation of his wayward son. But there's something, after reading the book and praying about it, uh, it seemed as if the, the father opened up something in my own awareness, something of his own heart. I finally discovered, in a personal way, something that's very basic to Christianity. The father loves me because I am his son. It's not that the father loves me if I have done good, and it's not that he hates me if I have done evil. I have done both good and evil in my life, but the Father loves me because I am his son. This bond can never be broken and will last for all eternity. God has made a commitment to us that he's not going to break. It may be that we strain the relationship and render it unfruitful because of our sins. We might need purification or even punishment to correct our waywardness and pave the way for our return. But we will always be children of the Father. And as such, we will always be loved by Him. And our eternal communion and love and joy will always be sought and willed by Him. We can read something about this in the, in the Psalms, in Psalm 89, where the Lord says um, about, about his, his chosen one, David here, it says, My truth and my love shall be with Him. He will say to me, you are my father, my God. I will keep my love for him always. With him my covenant shall last. If his sons forsake my law and refuse to walk as I decree, I will punish their offenses with the rod. I will scourge them on account of their guilt. But I will never take back my love. I will never violate my covenant or go back on the word I have spoken. But that's what we have to hear from, from God, that he has made a covenant with us, that he loves us. And no matter what we do, even if he has to you know, come down hard on us, like I said, I will punish them, I will scourge them, but I will not take back my love. I will not violate my covenant. And so we have to hold on to that and realize that God is always going to be uh, there for us. Be, be with us. So um, we should be we should be eager to repent then, which is which is what Lent is mostly about, 
knowing that God doesn't hold it against us and will always love us, even if he has to correct or discipline us along the way. And he, and he does. It's just, you have your, your own children, you have to correct and discipline them, but you don't stop loving them. Well, it's the same thing with our relationship with God. So one other uh, kind of fundamental uh, element of repentance we ought to look at is the recognition of our pride and the, and the renunciation of it. And conversely, the recognition of the rest of our sin and our humble acknowledgement of it and bringing it to God in repentance. The uh, parable of the Pharisee and the publican uh, is um, introduced by St. Luke like this. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous but despised others. Even without hearing the parable, there's much to reflect upon in that one verse. So this parable is really about our, our attitude, which is what our Lenten observances should be about. God reads our hearts and judges our attitudes. The attitude of the Pharisee was not acceptable in the sight of God because it was infected with pride in himself and scorn for others. Conversion of the heart has a lot to do with the shrinking of the head. To say that someone has a big head or a swelled head is a way of saying that the person is proud and a big ego, thinks too highly of himself, or is always thinking about himself. The late great Malcolm Muggeridge relates a rather humorous anecdote that brings out the point. He was attending an exhibition at Madame Tussauds famous wax museum with its strikingly realistic wax figures of famous persons. He writes, the most interesting part of the whole experience was being taken on a tour of the exhibition's nether regions, <clears throat> that is the basement of the place, which is not open to the general public, where there was a remarkable collection of bits and pieces of waxworks, various body parts lying about. <clears throat> what fascinated me most, however, was a collection of no less than six heads of Harold Wilson, who was prime minister at the time. I asked why six heads, and was told, believe it or not, that it was because during his period of office, his head had been growing steadily bigger, so it was necessary to redo it from time to time. <laughs> why, you may ask, keep all the six used heads? Because, it was calculated, once he was out of office, his head might begin shrinking again, and the old heads come in handy. <laughs> So we can never really get away with praying that prayer of the Pharisee, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. You know why? Because we are like other people. Perhaps not in all the particulars, but we're all sinners. We're all limited, defective, and usually rather selfish, and yes, often proud and conceited as well. So there's only one prayer left to us, the prayer of the publican. God be merciful to me as sinner. And Jesus tells us that that's the one that works. That's the one that wins his heart because it flows from the humility that's based on truth. That's why this prayer, it was somewhat ad adapted to use the name of Jesus, is the prayer in the Byzantine monastic tradition, the most loved and practiced prayer. I'm sure you know it, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When you re repeat this continuously, it becomes a part of you, even, even a part of your, your breathing, your, your heartbeat, your, your sleeping. Calling upon Jesus as the Son of God makes him uh, present within us. We abide in God and he in us. You can pray, pray the prayer at an explicit time where you just sit down to pray it, or you pray it all during the day, uh, keeping, as the Father says, letting the mind descend into the heart to, to unify our, our soul and mind and spirit. And so it's also so it's the beginning of the contemplative prayer. But we should do something um, that um, keeps us in, in conscious contact with the Lord, because 
you know, okay, you get up in the morning, you make your morning offering, you might say a few prayers, maybe you go to daily mass, I hope you do, um, but uh, if not, whatever. Then you, then you go to work or, or whatever else you do during the day, and then maybe during the evening time again, and you all the way through the day. What were you doing during the day besides your work? See, we have to be um, in contact with the Lord all the time. And so a prayer like the Jesus prayer is something similar where you pray it as much as you can during the day. It keeps those lines of communication open. Because whatever you're doing, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, understand me. Um, or, or anything, just say the name of Jesus. Whatever works, whatever is easiest for you to do. Or you can also um, you know, make yourself a note somewhere at home or your workplace that you know, during the day, once every whatever, hour or two hours or something, just take like 60 seconds, just 60 seconds and stop and, and just recollect yourself and say, who, who am I, what am I, why am I, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a child of God, I'm here to serve God, to love God, to know God, and so it, it kind of brings us back from just the, the, the craziness of everything else we might be involved in and, and uh, too, too absorbed in. So we step back for just the 60 seconds. Anybody, no matter how busy you are, you got 60 seconds that you can that you can give to God here and there during the day. So to so try to do something like that, you can begin with as a Lenten uh, discipline, but then carry it on. Don't give it up after Easter. Uh, do it, do it more, and so to you grow into it, into it. Uh, 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 a habit of just stopping every once in a while and connecting to God, thanking Him for whatever He's blessed you with up until this hour, and renewing your, your love for Him and your desire to serve Him, and then go back to work. And then an hour later or so, stop for 30 or 60 seconds and, and do it again. That way your whole day is punctuated with moments of prayer. So you haven't left God at home in your little prayer corner when you left and went to work during the day. You took him with you and you have been with him all during the day. And so um, one of the fruits of this prayer, of the Jesus prayer, or any prayer that's repeated often during the day, is uh, that peace which surpasses all understanding that St. Paul talks about, which is very important. Um, because it helps us to detach ourselves from the things of this world, and as St. Paul says in Colossians 3, to set our minds and hearts on things of heaven. St. Seraphim of Sarov, a, a Russian saint in the 19th century, said, acquire inner peace and a thousand souls around you will be saved. That's an amazing thing. If you acquire inner peace, which is the peace of, of Christ, oh, thanks, I have one. I guess. Am, am I getting hoarse or something? I, 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 maybe, maybe that was a hint, I'll just take a look. It took us an hour and a half to, to get here. Now, I, didn't, I was afraid I didn't want to talk the whole trip because I didn't have nothing left to say. You didn't say anything when I got here. And another thing about this, this inner peace that kind of radiates out, and it's very important that he said that, that to acquire inner peace is not just something for your own well-being. If you have the peace of Christ that passes understanding, it's going to radiate out, radiate out from you. And it's going to affect others. It's going to draw them into, into and then they may even ask you, where do you get this peace? And that's when you can start talking about uh, Jesus. And so in a similar vein, the Saint Elizabeth Ann Seton, who lived a very active life, said, never be hurried by anything whatever. Nothing can be more pressing than the necessity for your peace before God. You will help others more by the peace and tranquility of your own heart than by any eagerness or care we can bestow upon them. Because anything we do for them flows from them. So um, this peace that it brings is the way, the beginning, the beginning of the way to inner stillness, which someone suggested I talk about. But the art of inner, inner stillness cannot be explained in a 45 minute talk. Maybe in 45 years, it can be a <laughs> But 
We have to start somewhere. So we'll, we'll start now with something about the, uh, the practice of the Lectio Divina, which concerns the, the prayer for contemplation of the Word of God. But we have to realize first that on the, the most profound level, the Word of God is not just a collection of divine utterances, words of God, but is the Word of God, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, to whom all things are made, and to whom the Father and the Holy Spirit and all mysteries of the King of Heaven have been revealed to us. The Word became flesh, the Gospel tells us. It doesn't say the Word became book. He became flesh so that he could live in our midst and teach us and sacrifice us uh, himself for our sins. But also, the Word became flesh so that flesh could become Word, that we could be taken up into the very person and life of the Divine Word, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. This transformation happens most profoundly in the Holy Eucharist. So the Word became flesh also in order that its flesh could become bread, bread from heaven, bread that we can literally eat as life-sustaining food, bread that He gives for the life and salvation of the world. So when we speak of the Bible as the Word of God, let's always remember that we read or listen to these divine words in order to be more personally united to the eternal Word made flesh to hear his voice, to discover his will, and to enter more fully into the mysteries of the kingdom of God. A divine mystery is something that refers to the person and work of God, and to that which makes up the kingdom of heaven. A mystery is something that God has partly revealed to us, enough to know for our salvation, but that's partly hidden from us. Not that he wants to hide stuff from us, but it's only because our, our capacity for understanding is so limited, we can't embrace the whole infinite mystery of God. There's always going to be things that are, that are hidden to us, that are beyond our understanding. But the Lord does reveal enough to us that we can understand so that we can uh, accept Him in faith and embrace Him in love and follow Him with all of our lives. I mean, I bills. <laughs> so we're seeking when we read the word of God, the wisdom of God, entering into his light, his truth, his love, his sorrow, and his joy. Reading scripture can be part of your Eucharistic adoration, if you're, not, if you're reading not merely to acquire information, but in order to enter into the Lord's presence and meet him. Because since he's personally present in the Blessed Sacrament, we're more likely to be illumined by his word or into this context and able to enter more fully into the divine mysteries. Lectio Divina simply means divine reading. I read a legendary story a long time ago about a Jewish man who, was, who had a vision of heaven opening. He saw God in heaven. And what was God doing? Well, he happened to be reading the book of Numbers at the time. I think the message was supposed to be that the scriptures are so profound that even God needs to meditate upon them. <laughs> but for us, divine reading doesn't refer to something God does, or that God reads. This means that we are reading divine words. And we have to read them, then, in a way that's different than we read other words. For, for this to, to happen, we should pray to the Holy Spirit but before we open the Bible to ask that we will receive a message from Him. We're not, we don't read the Bible just to, I mean, there's a place for Bible study where it's good to learn things about the Bible. But when you, when you, when you do Lectio Divina, you sit down to receive a message from God through the Bible. And so you pray the Holy Spirit to show you that message, to, to, to guide you. Um, that, that happens to me all the time. Every, every morning I, I read the Bible, and I always, I always pray the Holy Spirit to um, direct me to whatever words that he has anointed and appointed for me that day, whether to enlighten or instruct me or, or correct me or whatever. Um, 
and then it's often really very, very much, you know, to to the point. Um, I remember once that I was uh, actually more than once. This happens a lot because I <laughs> I get awakened very early to do visions <coughs> oftentimes, and, and sometimes I I, um, I complain about my, my lack of sleep. And so I remember on one of these mornings I, I opened the Bible. And it was in, I think it's First Thessalonians, and I, I looked down and I said, do not sleep as others do. <laughs> my, <laughs> there's my answer. <laughs> and, and actually, there's a, there's a lot of things about vigils in there that I discovered, because I'm always being told to not complain about it, you know, because, because it's something that God does. And, and another warning opened up and it says, I will I withheld sleep from your eyes. Said, oh, okay, it was, it was you then. <laughs> So, but, but, and there are much more important things that God wants to talk to us about, and, and he does. If you, if you do this regularly, I mean, don't just play Bible roulette every once in a while when you, when you got a serious need, but do it all the time. Open the Bible, and God will show you what he, what he wants you to see. If you're seeking him, if you want to know his will, if you pray to him to show you, he will. Because there's so much in the scriptures that really does uh, speak directly to our own situation and need and the things that we ask of our Lord. So um, it's, 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 the scriptures are more, probably the most important way that God speaks to us. You know, how is he going to speak to us except through his word? That's how he speaks. Um, uh, unless you're, unless you're a, a mystic and you're, you're hearing directly from God and don't need the scriptures anymore, but I don't know if that applies to all of us in this room. But Listen to him through the word of God. And when you sit down to pray or to listen to the word of God, just read and don't decide I'm going to read from here to here. And then that, that's your plan. It's not your plan. It's God's plan. So you just read until you feel that God has spoken to you and then stop right there. Uh, as little as, as you are led to read or as much as you're led to read. And then whatever you hear, hold on to it. I, I make a note every day of, of what I read. I, I have little the index cards and a little spiral binder. And every day uh, when I read something, whatever strikes me, I, I write down a few verses there. And that's that's going to somehow either guide me through the day or it's going to be an answer to something I'd already asked for. And so I have, I have stacks of these little things. I, I kept most of them. And so I'll go back to them sometimes and open them sort of randomly. And sometimes there'll be a word there exactly what I need to hear that was given to me whatever, last year or something. But, but when you keep a record of these things, you can also see, as you go back over them from time to time, how God has been leading you. You, you might not see the pattern, just looking at each day as, as an individual day, but look over the past month and see, what, what has he said to you for the last month? And see, he may be he a lesson that's not just for one day, but that is built up over, over many days and weeks. And he's going to be teaching you something that he wants you to know from the scripture. And so um, when you uh, receive a word from the Lord and, and know it, then take it into prayer. Uh, listen to it, respond to it, reflect on it. Uh, and then resolve to, to live that word uh, during that day. And the Lord will, will oftentimes provide opportunities for you um, to put that word to practice. And sometimes I'll get a word that maybe I don't know exactly what it means, but something will happen during the day and I'll, say, I'll remember it. And I'll say, oh, that's why I got that word in Scripture, because I needed it to, to, for this uh, situation or for this you know, uh, the counter. So let that word then be a, like a point of departure for your, for your prayer. There's, there's another thing that I'd like to share here that's, that's not usually, as far as I know, mentioned in uh, teachings on Lexio Divina, but which I have found to be a great blessing in my own experience. Our Lady, as our Heavenly Mother and Teacher, can also use the words of scripture when she wants to speak to you, if you ask her to. See, well, the way I do it, I, I mean, first of all, I ask, I, I ask our Lord, the Holy Spirit, to, to show me, uh, you know, the anoint, uh, and let me see what he's anointing the point for me that day. But then I ask our lady to guide my hand in, in opening the Bible, so that she will take me there. 
And so um, she can speak to us through the scriptures if she wants to, and if God sends her to do this. Most likely, you'll be able to hear her voice through the epistles where God doesn't speak directly, but is referred to in the third person. <coughs> For example, we can hear our lady's voice in a passage like this from Philippians. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy. And I am sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel thus about you, because I hold you in my heart. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. That would fit perfectly on the lips of Our Lady. And uh, I've received many messages from her in this way. It's another way of being more deeply integrated into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Because their life is a family affair. And well, today is the Feast of St. Joseph. And that's part of the Holy Family. So the mother has a very important role to play in this family. I read something in a, in a book from uh, Catherine Doherty. She likes to use Russian titles for her, for her books. And this one's called Bogorodica, uh, which is Russian for She Who Gave Birth to God. It's like, like the, the, the Russian version of Theotokos in, in, in Greek. And this supported my experience of Our Lady opening the scriptures to me. Uh, she writes, just sit down comfortably at Mary's feet and be silent with her. Let your silence have that quality of listening recollection that's so necessary for hearing her silence speak. When you are silent, reverently and simply so, with the silence of a great love for Mary, the mother of God, she will arise and, taking you by the hand, lead you into the inner chamber of her immaculate heart, where all the words of her son are still kept as fresh and alive as when he spoke them. Still silently, she will take each word and show it to you. In her hands, each word will glow and open as a flower opens to the sun and will reveal many a hidden or unclear meaning to you. And you will marvel that you did not see it before. That often happens to me, and she shows me things that I haven't heard or understood before. And, and at the right time, sometimes I will see a passage that I've read many times before, but suddenly I'll see it, uh, uh, something about it that I never noticed before. It happens to be something that applies to me at that very moment. And that's the way the Holy Spirit uh, works uh, through the, the Word of God. So one of the things that... Um, is important also for Lexio Divina is reading it with according to the mind and heart of the church. Because the Bible is not our own personal uh, book for, for you know our own uh, making up stuff for ourselves. And see, this is one of the problems that that, that develops because of the, the Protestant uh, Reformation or some called revolution. Um, because they rely on personal interpretation of the scripture. And the reason that there are 30,000 different Protestant denominations in this country alone is because nobody agrees on what the scripture means. And as soon as they have a fight about it, they start a new church. So, so that's, that's not what Christ means by let, let them all be one. So we have to read scripture according to the mind of the church, the, the magisterium of the church, which is able to interpret the scriptures for us. Now the church doesn't give us a whole list of scriptures to say this is what it means, each, each verse or something, but because of the teachings of the church, we know uh, most of the church tells you what something doesn't mean. The church, the church points out uh, throughout our history what the errors, what the heresies were. So it's like, if someone says this, that's wrong, don't believe that. Uh, and then, um, then you fill out the picture as you, as you read, so you know that that thing is excluded. And so we and then you your catechism, just for a more positive um, um, uh, explanations. So um, the the Bible uh, is is in some passages, many passages, notoriously difficult to interpret, and that's why we need the church. And so we also have to realize that the, that the church in the first generation of her existence 
lived solely by the oral tradition of the apostles, at least as far as the New Testament is concerned, as far as Jesus' teachings are concerned, and so was quite capable of living a life of faith and good works and prayer and worship without even having a New Testament for proof texting purposes. So um, Jesus uh, instituted the Eucharist long before the New Testament to Jesus. So we have to realize that the church is not based on the Bible, but rather the Bible is based on the church. The Bible is a fruit of the church's life and testimony. It was produced by the church, at least the New Testament, and the books that are contained in it were recognized and declared by the church to be the word of God. So let's, I don't know, we started a little bit late, so I think I have to go a little bit late. I want to uh, I want to just go through a couple of things here, but I don't want to. Okay, I'll give you just one example of, of interpreting something in the scripture uh, and seeing what's in there, both in relationship to the, the whole unity of the scriptures and, and also to the life of the church. Um, just uh, two Sundays ago, we had the Gospel of the Transfiguration, the second Sunday of Lent, and. There's some important things about that that you won't always get by a superficial reading of the scripture. One of the things is, it says at least in Luke's version, when Moses and Elijah uh, appeared to him, it's, uh, with him, it says that um, they spoke to him about his exodus in Jerusalem. Now for some unknown reason, most translators don't translate that literally. They tend to say his passage or something like that. But the gospel writer wanted us to see that. He spoke about his exodus in Jerusalem because it, he meant to make a clear link with the exodus of the chosen people from Egypt and what Jesus was doing for us, leading us out of the slavery of sin by his redeeming death on the cross. And so that we, that we need to get that, get, get a good Bible translation. Uh, the, probably the best one in English is, is the Revised Standard Version. The uh, Ignatius Press uh, publishes as a, a Catholic edition of the Revised Standard Version, which is, which is probably the most accurate of all uh, English translations. Although none of, none of them is perfect, but uh, that's, that's probably the best. So, um, there are other elements here. In, in, in chapter 24 of the book of Exodus, God called Moses to go to Mount Sinai to meet him and receive his divine commandments. A cloud surrounded the mountain, and Moses entered into the cloud to meet God. Well, on Mount Tabor, when Jesus was transfigured, a brilliant cloud overshadowed the mountain. And Luke tells us that the apostles, in fear and trembling, entered into the, crop, into the cloud. So they would have known that this is, this is what this means. They knew the scriptures. They know what a mountain means. They know what a cloud means. They know what the voice of God speaking out of the cloud means. So when that happened uh, with Jesus on the mount, they knew that God was, was doing something with them just as profound or more than what happened on Mount Sinai when God delivered his people from Israel. And then once they ratified the covenant with God in the, in the desert, the Israelites, Moses took the blood of sacrificed animals and spilled it on the altar and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you. Did you know that Moses said those words? Well, Jesus did. And so at the Last Supper, Jesus took a, wine, took a cup of wine and both fulfilling and transcending the previous covenant, he said, this is the blood of the covenant, the new and everlasting covenant. This is my blood, not the blood of sacrificial animals. This is the blood which is shed for you, which will deliver you from your sins. And so, um, this is these mysteries are are hidden in the scriptures, not so hidden you can't find them. But with a little bit of study and a lot of prayer. You can go deeply into the mysteries and see what God is trying to tell us through the scriptures, both to understand the whole mystery of our salvation and also to receive the personal uh, light uh, for, for our, ourselves and for our souls. And so, um, one thing, let's see, I want to uh, say something about um, our, the 100th anniversary of Our Lady's Evolutions of Fatima. This is, this is very uh, important 
I think that I don't know what's going to happen this year. If there, if there are many, many, uh, if some people are predicting that the great things are going to be happening in the world are going to be terrible things. I don't know, but I hope and I know that this year is going to be a, a year of special grace because of this hundredth anniversary. But it's also a special year of a calling to conversion because we didn't really do what our lady wanted us to do, which is asked a hundred years ago and appeared in Phantom a hundred years ago. Because the things she said, she said, you know, if you don't do what I say, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. Well those things all happened. Russia, you know, took over half of the world and spread her errors everywhere and all other kind of persecutions happened and all the rest. That would have happened if we did what she said. So now it's like we're getting, we're getting a second chance here. A hundred years have passed and we, we blew the first hundred. And so now as she's, she's asking us again, this is time to do this. That's why I put those Fatima prayers out there. We have disappeared already. And the, the other one that I photocopied, that one, that one Eucharistic uh, uh, reparation prayer. These prayers are asked of us to do. And so you've, you've got copies of these now. Um, they can be photocopied, distribute them around, and the other pamphlets. I have more of those pamphlets too. Um, we have to start doing this stuff because this is what she asked. And we, we, we should take it upon ourselves. Pray this for every single day to, to make reparation for all the Eucharistic sacrileges that are happening throughout the world. And stuff is happening all the time. It's stuff that, that we don't even know about, but most of it. Sometimes you hear something in the news. Uh, just just a, a few days ago, somebody broke into a, a church in, in Argentina and, and stole, stole a monstrance with a, with a consecrated host in it. And who knows what they do with the host? And then there, there was somebody in Spain a little while ago who carefully went to communion, uh, and this is what happens sometimes when you receive it in the hand, is he stole 200 hosts uh, from, from Catholic churches and then, then created some blasphemous artwork out of it and with, with consecrated hosts. And so there are so many things like this happening all the time, and that's why this angel came from heaven at Fatima before our lady even came and said, God is outraged by these sacrileges. Console your God and prostrate and pray these prayers. And so and he was, he's telling children, you know, to, to do this. And they took it seriously. They prayed these prayers all the time, prostrate on the ground, because this is important. If we really truly believe that Christ is present in the in the most holy sacrament of the altar then we have to do something to respond to this. It's like when someone is doing something horrible to someone you love, you rush in there and, and stop it. If someone is if someone is, is, is beating up somebody you love, you don't just say, oh well, that's the world, you know, that's how it goes. No, you rush in there and say, get out, get away. And so you then you protect your loved one. So this is what we do by prayers of reparation. We, we console, we protect uh, the mystery. We show the Lord how much we love and are grateful for what he's done for us to sacrifice himself, to, to make himself vulnerable to people who do evil things to him like this, just because he wants to be with us and to give himself to us. So we need to do something in response. This kind of reparation prayer is something that's important because it came right from heaven. And God said, I want you to do this. So how can we say, and got time? You know, we must do this. And so there are, there are those, those prayers. And then um, there's the, the, other, the other little things that, that I um, put out that will save a soul uh, via. I wish I thought more because they disappeared right away. But, but my contact information is on there. If you, if you want more to distribute, just, just contact me and I'll, I'll send you some more. Because this is important too for, for saving souls. Because as, as I say in there, uh, Jesus said to St. Faustina about you know, praying the Divine Mercy chapter to, to, and that it will, it will save uh, the most hardened of, of sinners. And, and, if you, and, if the, and if the sinner himself is going to pray, let's say he's, he's dying, well, he said that if you pray for that person, the, the pardon is the same. So 
we can have a direct result on the salvation of souls. And the ones who need it the most are the ones who are dying in their sins. So that's, so that's, what, that's why I want to explain in that pamphlet. I mean, everybody, everybody knows about the Divine Mercy uh, chaplet, but not everybody knows that you can pray it you know, for a person or persons who are dying in their sins right this moment and are about to lose their souls. Because you know, St. Faustina had these visions of uh, souls dying and these devils crowding around the deathbed, just waiting to grab the soul and drag it into hell because of the state of sin. But then she prayed the Divine Mercy Chapel and the Lord appeared with those rays coming forth from his heart and he scattered the devils and he brought that soul to himself and saved the souls. Well, we can do this. We can do this by praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet for souls that are dying in their sins right now. I do that every day, several times a day. Um, for whoever is dying right now and who's going to lose their soul unless they repent right now, I pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet for them. And the Lord brings uh, uh, grace to them. And there's, there's always, there's never a time when there's no need for this. I, I, I figured this out. I, I discovered that every day throughout the whole world, 150,000 souls on the average die and go to the judgment seat of God. Okay, 150,000 a day. That, that works down to 62.50 an hour, or about 104 a minute. So that means that every minute of every day and every night, at least a hundred persons are dying and going for the judgment seat of God. So there's never a minute when prayers for a conversion of sinners are not needed. And we can do a lot uh, to help. And that's what those uh, flyers about praying to divine mercy each other are about. So you can, you can get more from me, you can photocopy them, there's no copyright on it, there's no nothing, they have a million copies spread them all over the world, given to everybody, um, and uh, so that we can uh, save as many souls as possible. See, that's what the, the messages of, of Fatima were, are really all about. It's about conversion, about uh, penance, about reparation. And also it was about the, the revelation of the Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, pierced by, by thorns, seeking the reparation. And she asked uh, uh, Sister Lucia um, to sacrifice herself to make reparation for the sins committed against her. And, and she asked the, the, the children, you know, I, I find it amazing that uh, children were, were asked to do these heroic things. You know, once the angel appeared to the children the first time, he gave them the prayers to say, and they said, oh, that's, that's wonderful, and they prayed the prayers. And so later on, he came back some months later, and they're, they're kids, so they're out playing. And the angel says, what are you doing? I told you to pray. And so I was like, well, they're like, well, we're kids. Like, what do you expect? But no, make sacrifices continually to the most high. Make everything that you do a sacrifice. Turn it into something, a sacred action. That's what sacrifice means, a sacred action. Offer it to God. And if these kids could do it, and if these kids could, could take penances upon themselves and, and wear, wear ropes around their waist that shape their skin and, and give up food and, and drink, well, because they knew, they saw. They saw heaven through Our Lady and that light that shone from her heart and her hands and then they saw hell as well. So they knew what waits for us in the afterlife. And they said, you know, we gotta prevent people from going to hell so they can go to heaven and see what we have seen. And so they didn't spare themselves at all, but sacrifice themselves. And Our Lady offered her immaculate heart as our refuge and the way that will lead us to God. But it's, it's costly. It's, it's not just a sweet devotion. It's something that, that costs something uh, of ourselves, that demands something of ourselves, to share in, in the work of Christ in saving souls. And Christ is the one who carried his cross all the way to Calvary and was nailed on that cross for our salvation. And he's asking us through his mother to share in his work, share in his, in his passion, passion, because um, anything that's worthwhile costs something. 
that demands some sacrifice and suffering. Yes, it's inescapable. Well, everyone has to suffer. You might as well use them, use your sufferings for a good purpose. Offer uh, to God for, for His glory and for the salvation of souls. And just like our lady said, that one of the prayers is in that little pamphlet. Whenever you make a sacrifice, say, this is for, lo for love of Jesus, for conversion of sinners, and in reparation for the offenses committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So this is what uh, we're called to do, and she asked us to uh, do the first Saturday devotions as well, the confession and communion and the rosary on the first Saturdays, to, uh, to the five first Saturdays because of the five ways that her, she blasphemed, attacks upon her immaculate conception, attacks against her perpetual virginity, attacks against her divine maternity and refusal to accept her as our mother, uh, uh, those who publicly uh, turn children away from her, and those who insult her directly in her sacred images. God wants us to make up for this, because he does not tolerate his mother being uh, uh, abused by that in the public square. There are many, I've read too many to begin to speak about the blasphemies publicly and see that the, the, the <laughs> Satanists are, are rising to, to a, 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 an unheard of status in this society now. And they're doing public blasphemous rituals and with the permission of all the local civil authorities to, to desecrate statues of Our Lady and other horrible things that they do. And now, I don't know if you've heard about this or not, but um, they're, over here and there in this country are popping up these little after-school Satan clubs. They're going into schools and these groups of Satanists are taking children and, and you know, giving them this impression, oh, this little club, this little fun, and they teach them about the devil and to love and to serve the devil. And this is done, it's okay with the, with the government. They just received a, a, an IRS tax exempt status, like any church or nonprofit organization, Satanists starting with our children. So if this is happening, we, we gotta do this. We gotta pray, we gotta sacrifice, we gotta make the reparation because stuff is getting bad in this world and we need to, we need to do something about it. So anyway, sorry I'm, I'm, I'm over the paper time here, but I'll just conclude right now. Um, so um, the spiritual battle, says Mother Adela, the founder of religious order, will always have sin at its root. This sin stains and hardens the heart of man, weakens the church, and brings about the destruction not only of individuals, but of nations, peoples, and families. Because sin is the root of the battle, our mother calls us with urgency to authentic conversion and renunciation of the sin, indifference and doubt and rebellion. So then remember, whatever we do for Lent, the goal is an interior change, a new level of spiritual growth and understanding of the meaning of, of life and our faith. So let us then diligently seek an inner conversion of heart by which we will more and more resemble our Divine Father, our Heavenly Mother, and our eldest brother, the head of the body, of which we're all members. And recognizing that family resemblance, we will welcome us joyfully to the kingdom of heaven, where Easter is an everlasting feasting. Thank you.